Welcome to the Stay Grounded Podcast, brought to you by Java Press Coffee Company. My name is Raj Jana, and I'm the Chief Brewing Officer here at Java Press, where we help people make daily happiness a priority using the coffee we love. I interview people from all walks of life to discuss happiness, success, fulfillment, and ways to infuse it all into daily life. I want to dissect different thought processes and turn them into powerful insights that empower you to stay grounded and make daily happiness and fulfillment a reality. So thanks for joining me today. Now, let's get to grinding. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of the Stay Grounded Podcast. I'm your host, Raj Jana, and boy, am I, man, I'm so excited for today's guest. Um, so this is actually one of my one of my favorite conversations I've had. Not that I haven't enjoyed any of my other conversations, but this one in particular was just so amazing because of the person I'm interviewing who is... Uh, Dana Malstaff. Um, she is uh, a hell of a woman. Uh, she's the CEO and founder of Boss Mom, um, which is a community for um, moms who are trying to uh, build a business and nurture their families like 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 pros. And she's had over ten thousand students in various courses, and she helps women all over the world. Uh, she did this for herself. She built an incredible company um, while raising her kids. And she felt, and she believes that and I'll let her say this in her own words, but what I took away most from, from Dana was that um, she really believes that uh, in order for the best way to be a mom is to show your kids that anything is possible. And I just kept hearing that message again and again and again uh, throughout uh, our interview. And I'm so grateful for Dana being here and there's so much to learn here. Oh my gosh, she is awesome. So uh, I know you guys are going to pull a lot of value out of this one. So stay tuned until the very end because she gives away so much amazing goods. Um, but before we do that, I uh, just want to let you know, we thrive off of your ratings, your reviews, your insight, your just engagement with the community. Um, so if you haven't already, go ahead and leave a review or a rating. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on whatever medium works well for you. Um, I thrive off of this feedback. And the more you give me, the more I can just make this show better and better and better. So um, thank you so much for already being a part of this. And I cannot wait for for this episode to get started. I'm so excited, man. Um, so without further ado, here's Dana. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Stay Grounded podcast. Oh, my gosh. I uh, If you can't tell from the uh, in my voice, I'm really, really, really excited to be talking to today's guest, uh, Miss Dana Malstaff. Did I say that right? Is it Malstaff? Mal Malstaff. It, you I got the Malstaff right. It's like Dana Banana, though. Dana Banana, perfect. All right. Well, Dana Banana, <laughs> so happy to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. I'm actually super excited to be here today. Oh my gosh, me as well, me as well. So, uh, as you guys heard in the intro, uh, I, I gave a little background on 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 Dana Banana. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm going to, uh, so I'm not going to dive too much into that, but I would love to start Dana by having you sort of talk about your journey from, uh, kind of how this whole movement even started for you, um, uh, to go back to when you started and, and where you were and, and all the things that came up. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, things start where they normally start, which is where you have a problem and nobody yeah. can solve it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I um, I quit my job and was about to um, embark on my own consulting business. Um, my husband and I had been trying to have kids, and it uh, wasn't it wasn't working so well. And I think that's because I was working 15 hours a day, high stress job wow, yeah. um, at a director level. Loved it, loved the hustle and the bustle, but it was like all life consuming. And um, and I thought I loved it, like I thought I loved what I did. Um, but that just turns out, it just turns out that I loved accomplishing things. <laughs> Nope. Turns out there's a lot of other things I would have rather have accomplished than what I was yeah. doing in that job. But I left and on the night that was my last night, it was New Year's and uh, everybody took me out and celebrated and we had tequila shots and I immediately went home and I got pregnant. So <laughs> Wow. All right. <laughs> so I, I know my, I'm like, we're all adults here. Basically, yes. 
get drunk, you have babies. That's generally how it, how the easiest way to have babies works. So if you don't want babies, don't get drunk and have babies. Yeah. So, um, but the idea is, is I like truly boss mom style. I became an entrepreneur and a mom at the same time. And I, I had no idea how to be good at either. I didn't even really know what either of those entail. And no matter how much schooling or books you take, cannot prepare you for the decisions that you have to make in that scenario. Like it's not just about I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be good at whatever I'm doing. The stress that comes with parenthood and entrepreneurship is all about the decisions. There's a massive responsibility and weight on us to make decisions about our brand and about daycare and about, you know, teams and about trust and programs and all of these things. So I just found myself thrust into this space where none of my friends had kids. None of my friends were entrepreneurs. I was in Columbus, Ohio. I felt very alone, very isolated. There was a lot of crying about whether or not I'm a bad person because I wanted to send my kid to daycare because I didn't want to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, I was a you know six figure plus earner when I was in you know corporate, and I I have the mentality of a person who makes money, and so I wanted to make money, you know, and uh, and that's the problem that I couldn't solve that aloneness, that isolation, yeah, that feeling like I I felt bad about the decisions I was making, even though I shouldn't have, and we moved out to California where I'm originally from to be closer to my parents when my son was, I think, four or five months old. And it was a whole new world. It's a true testament to put yourself in an environment that cultivates what you want as opposed to challenges what you want. Because all of a sudden I was around a ton of entrepreneurs. Everybody I met had their own business. You know, there were women and moms who were, who had successful businesses. There were conferences everywhere. There were meetups all over the place. And, and all of a sudden I found myself in this space going, Oh, okay. I'm not crazy. This is totally (laughs) normal. And uh, yeah, and I, so I went to to write a book because I was a, a journalism major. I've always wanted to write a book. I was in a mastermind at the time um, with uh, Azul Taronis who helped Pat Flynn write his book. I just sort nice. of fell into this, you know, ma- free mastermind of colleagues. And and he's like, let's write a, if anybody in the group wants to write a book, I was like, I want to write a book. So we sat down, we, we mind mapped it. And what I thought I was going to write about my specialty, which was content strategy and helping people create courses and content and free content that led to paid content. And, um, everything that came out was like mom guilt and, and not just, not just mom guilt. Like let's not be guilty about how we raise our kids, but like, I want women who are, have the brains and the motivation to start businesses, to grow teams, to help this economy go, to, to make amazing amounts of money so that they can be charitable in other ways. I wanted to I wanted to write something that showed those women that doing that thing is massively important to raising good kids that are we should be able to show our kids that doing what we love is financially viable that I don't want work to be a negative word for our kids that I don't want kids to grow up and think they have to get a job to make money so they have enough money to do what they love. Yeah. And so it was just this, you know, thing that and so I put it out into the community. I was like, let's like, how does everybody feel about this? It got crazy response. I went out and asked everybody, what should we name it? And gave them a couple options. Boss mom was my least favorite, by the way. <laughs> and it's what everybody picked. And so I listened to the audience and it, ever since then, it just went so well. We were like, let's start the podcast. Let's start the academy. Let's start yeah. the retreat. Let's start the one day workshop. Let's start, let's write more books. And it we basically have just been slapping boss mom on everything we can ever since. How many moms have you helped to date? Oh gosh. Well, that's oh gosh. I would probably say in like fifty thousand range wow, if we include book sales, you know, from the group, from our coaching, from our events, all those kinds of things. Yeah, which is not even remotely in the realm of how many people I actually want to help, <laughs> considering the millions of moms out there. But it's a good start considering of course. Yeah. we launched the brand just over, you know, not even quite two and a half years ago, uh, and how much it's grown in that amount of time, especially with the resources we had. And I wrote the book while pregnant with my second child published it three or four months after she was born and launched the program with a two-year-old and a newborn. Wow. <laughs> so, so you can totally do it, ladies. In fact, I find, even though it's a horrible decision to do all these things during massive life-changing events, inevitably you get pregnant and you 
move houses, you move, you know, states, you write books, you launch yeah. businesses. It's like in that catalyst of, of life changing events in your life, you start to really think about what's important to you. And that's most often when I find women make huge life decisions because they're truly thinking inward about what do I want? What life am I building for my kids? Like what life am I building for myself? And, and all of a sudden then you're like, crap, I've just made life changing decisions during life changing situations. <laughs> we can't just, so, just so everybody listening, like you're not the only one that does that. And sometimes it's super stressful, but a lot of times it's helps you come to decisions about making changes in your life that are probably really important to make. How do you cultivate that? That like, It sounds like there's a level of uncertainty and discomfort that comes when making these types of decisions. How do you navigate that when you're going through so many life changes? I mean, how does, how does one mm-hmm. feel like they're not going to crumble and break apart just from all of this? I mean, it's, I can't imagine what, what you went through. Um, and you're obviously standing here brilliantly telling your story. So I'm, I'm, I would love to know just for my own personal interest, uh, how do you do it? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I talk a lot about decision confidence and decision support. So decision confidence is, um, is just that feeling that if we are completely confident in our decision, then guilt has no place in our decision making because what happens is guilt comes in when we waver on whether or not we did the right thing. Mm. Wow. If I would have done it differently, would this have happened? If you have complete decision confidence, then you're, you've moved past that decision into what's happening after the decision. So you're now gathering information for the next decision because our lives are basically just a series of decisions that we make every day. Some conscious, some unconscious. So decision confidence, the question becomes not how do we navigate all this stuff going in our life without breaking down? The question is how do we get more confident in the decisions we're making so that we have less stress about what's happening? And I think that that for me, that is a daily review of what's important in my life. I think I always know, like I, I talk about knowing your deal makers and your, uh, or sorry, your dream makers and your deal breakers. Mm. So for me, always sitting down and going, okay, for me, when my daughter was born, I love to speak. I love to speak. But my deal breaker was if I'm gone from home for more than two days because I have a brand new baby. And if I am, you know, and if it has certain criteria of things, then I won't do it. So I said no to a lot of things that came across my, you know, my desk because in the first year of my daughter was born, because I weighed it against things I had predetermined were deal breakers for me. Like, yes, I want to speak, but I'm not willing to sacrifice this particular time. And once my daughter hit one, then it was like, okay, well now I've got a little more leeway. I'm going to reassess my deal breakers, you know, and my dream makers are okay. This is kind of puts me out of place here, but I want to be on this stage or I want to do this thing. And so I'm willing to consciously know that I'm going against what my normal rules are because I have already set that if this opportunity comes up, I will say yes. So predetermining your dream makers and your deal breakers will help you make decisions. So that's one thing. The second thing is every day I get up and I say, okay, well, I use something that's called the self journal. So it's I a 12, Catherine 13 week journal. They are yeah. good friends. <laughs> I'm a huge. Oh, good. Huge, yeah. Alan's yeah, one of my I best love friends. it. Oh my gosh. I'm I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So I love it because yeah. Cause I look at it and I can every day go, okay, what was my like quarter goal? Am I getting towards that? Like, okay, this week, what am I trying to accomplish? Am I making time for the habits I want to create? Okay, good. In the day. Okay. Now what am I accomplishing today? And it helps me say yes and no to things. Right. Yes. And I have an actual annual calendar. So I've laid in, what are holidays I want to be on? What are vacation days? What are, you know, celebrations I want to have? Okay. What are events I want to go to? What? And I lay out all my calendar. We actually have it in Trello, my full, annual calendar so that when we look at it, it helps me make decisions to go. I don't have time to promote that thing. So we've got to say no to that decision or, Oh, I've got time here, but does it really, someone just came to me and said, we'll give you this tool for free. And you, you know, and you, you can give someone in your community this thing for free and then we'll kind of have an affiliate program. And the question had to become because before I would have probably said, Oh, yay, more things. I'll take free things. But now I don't. Now I ask myself that question of, does it align with what I'm trying to accomplish? Mm, Like if what I'm teaching work, am I going to have any clients or things come down the line where this doesn't make sense? Like what, and I'm actually, it helps me make decisions. So getting that decision support 
framework up front about what you want, what you don't want, the daily assessment of, is this actually helping me? How does it lay in against my full year of what I want to accomplish? And that decision support creates decision confidence. So every day I can make decisions about, oh, you know what? I'm going to miss my son's karate class because this interview is really important. But I consciously know that's okay because I my goal is to go there twice a month to his class. And if I'm starting to miss that, then I can start to feel that like, okay, I'm not doing what I said I was going to do. So I need to make sure I'm not overlapping those times because sometimes your business is going to take precedent over your family. And sometimes your family is going to take precedent over your business. And sometimes your self care is going to take precedent over both. And it's not bad. There is no balance. There's integration and just conscious decisions about what you're doing so that you don't feel bad about what you aren't doing. You can just feel good about what you are doing. I'm a big fan of, uh, I don't like work-life balance. I like work-life harmony. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, that's the word I tend to use when I'm describing the things that matter most to me. But what I love about what you're doing is you've essentially removed decision fatigue from everything because you've got, you've got your, your, your dream makers and your deal breakers, and then you review them every day through a process. So what is, what is your daily like routine look like? Like, do you wake up and review your goals? You obviously use a self journal. Um, Mm -hmm. but Beyond that, like, what does your daily routine look like so that you're cultivating this practice every day instead of it just being something that kind of, you know, like you review once a year or like, how, how does it show up, show up for you every day? Yeah. So my review is actually in the evening. Um, I know myself, so I'm not a morning person. So I'm not good about like getting up before everybody and being in bed and having my coffee and review. Like that never happens for me. Like sometimes <laughs> I want to sleep in something like I like the idea that sometimes my mornings aren't the same. Um, so that, that for me, my review happens at night because I know I have that time. And if I've emptied everything out of my head, I can sleep much better. Mm. So anything on my list that's like, Ooh, that thing's bothering me or I need to remind this person. And I have a really good team. So I have an, an executive virtual assistant where I will just voxer her and I'll put a note that says like, listen to this for tomorrow stuff. Hey, make sure this goes in the calendar. Did we reply to this person? And I'll just rattle off from my head. I need to get these things out of my brain. Yeah. I sleep better. So that's like, for me, it happens at night on Sunday nights. I actually have an accountability partner and we go through our goals for the next week. So I'm an extrovert. I'm a people person. So I like to talk it out. I'm a speak yeah. to think person. So we'll talk it out and be like, Oh, does that make sense? Should I do that? Okay. Yeah. This is the priorities for this following week. So mine are in the evenings for morning people totally do it in the morning. I would just say, do whatever works for you from a daily review standpoint of reassessing. Um, and that, that'll definitely, <laughs> that's definitely important. But I also joke that after a certain time and for certain things, I won't make decisions. So for instance, in a lot of instances, food for me, I'm, I'm not a massive foodie. Like I like, I, like if I could literally take a Willy Wonka pill that just tasted like delicious food, but I didn't have to cook it or worry about it, that would be me. Um, and I like cooking, but not like for sustenance. I like cooking every once in a while for the fun of it. Yeah. So for me, like all, I will literally say out loud, whoever I'm going out to eat with or whatever we're doing, I have, I have met my decision-making threshold for today somebody else make this decision. And I will do that sometimes. I'll, I'll be on a phone with my, I was just on the phone before and we we're talking about hotel space and things for, um, you know, for a one day mini I'm doing in, in um, Ohio. And she was telling me things and I said, you know what? Stop right there. You know how to make this decision. I trust you. Like this is not a decision I need to pull into my life or my brain yeah. right now. You take care of it. I'm, the space is going to be great. This is like the eighth one we've done. You are now have my permission to make these decisions. And, and I think you have to do that. I think you have to offload decisions that don't serve you or don't need to take up the space in your brain because all of our decisions have some kind of weighing on us and they take time and they take mental effort. Um, and the more you can just push off the ones that don't matter um, in terms of moving you forward uh, and aren't worthy of the stress that we allocate to them, um, I think the better. <laughs> Do you have a process for um, offloading these types of decisions? Is that something that's done each evening where you just get out your phone or your boxer and you just kind of offload any decision that's on your mind or do you have a more formal approach or process for kind of establishing what type of decisions need to be off your plate? 
Yeah, there's a couple things. One, we use Trello, which Trello is a like an online project management right. workflow tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's my love. Like we have a full training, free training that we give everybody on, on that I'm really mostly, actually I'm pretty known for um, that that's amazing. So I, uh, both personal and business, Trello is like my, I call it my work wife. So that we do have all of these established systems. I'm a big believer when you start hiring people into your team, when you have a business or even at home, like the roles that different people play, I'm not a big believer that there's one person that fills all the things. So you're like, I want a virtual assistant or I want a home manager or I want to, you know, those kinds of things. I'm not a big believer that the one person can do everything else that's needed to be done in your yeah. life. I'm a big believer that there are very specific people for very specific roles. I even believe that from a support standpoint, like I wouldn't go to my mom and ask her business advice. I go yeah. to my mom to ask very specific kinds of parents. I don't even go to my mom for all my parenting advice. Yeah. Right. And then I go to my best friend for relationship advice. And then I go to my business, you know, accountability partner for business advice. And I go to a mentor for this kind of, so I think if we can get more specific with the roles that different people and different systems pay, play in our life and stop trying to think that there is one thing that will solve all the things, life becomes so much easier. So for my Mm. executive VA, she manages my calendar and she manages my travel and she manages my email. It's very specific. So it's really easy for me to go, oh, that's a Danielle task, right? I have a community manager. She specifically manages communities. When things come up within Facebook community or things happen that deal with community development, super easy. That's NJ, right? I've got a, a technology person that's my funnels and my website pages. Immediately, I know who to go to. And so instead of having one person that they can get overloaded and one person where it's like, oh, they should just have everything. Like I immediately know who manages that process. And then I have in my business, I have a director of operations and that person is just managing projects and she helps me manage people. So every week we have an operations meeting and we say, what are our projects? Each person in my team says, has 90 seconds to say, here's what's happening, including me. I have to like, this is the inclusivity and the transparency I like in my business for me to say, this is how much we sold. This is how we're over or under what our goals were. Like, this is what we plan on launching. Here's what I felt went well. Here's what I felt didn't go well. Here's the great things I'm hearing about people on the team or things we need to work on. So we each have our 90 seconds. And then we go into, okay, what are the current projects happening? What has to happen? Are we on schedule, not on schedule? And then we go from there. So every week there's an operations meeting and that helps set the tone for what has to get done. And everybody feels, even though every single person on my team is an independent contractor, I don't have a single time employee on my team. Um, and they're pretty much all boss moms. Um, we all, f- everybody feels really invested in my brand because I treat everybody like a team member. I treat everybody like we're a family. Yeah. Um, and we, we allow people to go up within the ranks, tell us things they like and don't want to do. If somebody says, I don't want to do something anymore, we put it on them to help us find a replacement for that particular thing and understand the new dynamic. Um, and so I think that open communication and within your family, it's the same way. Like everybody sort of assume role, assumes roles. You've got to every week kind of have your rally about what's working and what's not working yeah. and reassess and grow like in both of those instances. That's why I love the, the family, like the mom and the business side so much because there's so many correlations. Yeah. Like raising a business is just like raising a, a child. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me ask you this. What I love about you is you, you feel, I just feel like you've got buckets for everything. Like your mind is sort of divided into buckets for buckets for your team members. You have you know which team members are going to do what. Like you've got everything categorized in your mind. How does self care come into this conversation? Um, oh, I love this that, question. Is that is that something that that you actively work on for yourself? And if so, how does that show up for you? Yeah. So in the beginning, not even a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I'll just like I was in complete survival mode for like two years of my life. And so for everybody listening, you have permission to totally be a hot mess for some time. (laughs) 
Right. I mean, cause it just happens. Like if you have a baby, you're not going to have a baby. And a month later, like the, the people that look like they're a hundred percent put together right after they have a kid is just a facade that yeah. they're putting on <laughs> probably for you and them to make them feel like there's some, that's their first step of self care is to shower. Yeah. You no. Know? <laughs> you know? Um, but, but I'm like, I give permission to people like all the systems and things. And it looks like I've got all my stuff together. Like I'm two and a half years in and my son is about going to be five. So I'm like four and a half, five years in to being a parent, two and a half to really owning my own business that was, right. that's been working. Um, so I'm just now getting my stuff together. Like, let's just be clear. It takes some time, yeah. but I do think it becomes a choice for me. I was in survival mode and, it, and my brain couldn't even fathom. Like I used to joke with a point of pride that I didn't get to shower every day. And, you know, that I would wear my yoga pants, but with a pair of heels. So I felt like a lady, which I do like to do, um, you know, and those, and those things, but you know, and that how I needed wine to survive. And, you know, every time I thought of exercising, I would lay down until it passes, you know, and all of those things that are, that we sort of joke with a point of pride that like, nobody's got time for that. Like I've got 80 other people in my family to think about, like, yeah. I don't have time for me, but there's a point when that stops working. And the, and I think the, the people that really survive and succeed versus the people that have flounder and have a really hard time are the people that recognize when that opportunity cost starts to hit. Mm, right. When that like, yeah, like when that, that, okay. Survival mode is you're allowed survival mode. Sometimes man, there's just a lot of stuff going on in life and it becomes really hard to make you the center. And I get it, but that's not sustainable. Yeah. Right. That's like, going on the full tank of gas. And at some point your gas, you got to stop at the gas station fill up. And I luckily was at a point in my business where, um, you know, I was introduced to the idea of a virtual trainer. Yeah. Um, and I think to self care is a lot about knowing yourself, like going and just getting a gym membership just never worked for me. I would get it. And then I'd feel bad because it was a waste of money because mm -hmm. the time to get dressed, go there, you know, do all the things business or family would always just always take over. And so when it was like, okay, well that's not working, Dana, like beating it over the head and like the definition of insanity of doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, you have to try something different. So virtual training, um, became something that I started doing. So mm -hmm. twice a week I meet with somebody who, um, who does virtual training with me. So we do like we box on Wednesdays um, and I have a boxing thing. Cause I used to do that back before kids. And, um, and I've been with him a full year now and my, my body, my everything has never been the same, like flat out lost almost 20 pounds. For you. Like I'm yeah. super toned. I feel really strong and I will never leave him now. Right. Because it's, it actually, I've tried a bunch of different things until I found the thing that worked and now like I've got somebody holding me accountable and that's what I need. Mm -hmm. That parlayed into me doing the whole 30, um, which was me not knowing why I was tired and me going, you know what, but I love bread. Like nobody's going to get me to not love bread. But I did the whole 30, which is basically an elim elimination yeah. diet. I got rid of everything thing and was like, and I like, I it could challenge cause I'm competitive. So I was like, I, I joined a group where we all did the whole 30 and I was like, oh, I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. And what it did for me is that all of a sudden when I, at the end, it was a horrible 30 days, by the way, I hated every minute of it. Right. Yeah. Cause I was like, I just want to eat my bread. <laughs> but at the end of the 30 days, when you reintroduce things, that's when my life changed because I reintroduced bread, grains, those kinds of things. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I'm exhausted again. And yeah. that's when my brain changed and my brain went, oh wait. So it's not just that you love the taste of bread. It legitimately makes you tired and groggy. I don't really need that anymore. And I, I don't really eat bread any, a whole lot anymore. So it's like finding the different systematic things. And I only did one thing at a time. Like I'm going to focus on exercising. I'm not going to eat all that perfectly. We're just going to focus on getting stronger. Okay. Now I'm going to focus on this. Okay. Now I'm going to shower every day. Okay. Now I'm going to like buy some clothes that fit my body and make sense. And then make me feel like me. And that, so just one thing at a time, like if your house is a mess and your self care is trying to clean up your house, don't take a whole day to clean your entire house. Just in between your meetings or whatever it is, just empty the dishwasher. You don't even yeah. have to refill it. 
just put the stuff in the washer. Like you don't have to fold everything. Like just do one tiny thing at a time in a week or two or three or four, all of a sudden you'll have built a habit and you'll look around and your house will be clean or you'll have showered every day or mm. all of a sudden you're eating healthier. You're such an amazing person. I, I love that you're <laughs> definitely, well, oh, I'm <laughs> serious. I, 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 well, I, I thank you. <laughs> I, I love your, I love your definition of self care. It's, it's actively, choosing um, to implement healthy habits in your life. Um, I love that mm -hmm. that's your definition of self-care. And so what are some daily non-negotiables for you? Like how does, like what's something that you have to do every day to keep yourself moving and, and inspired and happy and, and kind of every, like excited to do all the things you're already doing? Okay, I have funny ones. Okay. Great. Uh, one is I have to shave my legs every day because I, for some reason I dress nicer um, and I'm more confident, like I just feel put together. It's like something that we, we neglect all the time, but I figure if I want to touch my legs, then that's just a nice thing to have, <laughs> right? <laughs> and believe me, all the moms are going, shave your legs, that sounds like so much work, but I'm telling you, it changed my life. And I actually have a razor subscription. It's called the All Girls Shave Club, which is like the men's dollar shave club. Yeah. So I get like razors and special razory things like nice. my Yeah, it's amazing. So that's one flossing is the other one because if I like feel like I'm taking care of my teeth, which I had a, like a great uncle one time that was literally like, if the only thing you do in your life is take care of your teeth, it will be the best thing you ever do because it's linked so much to your, your mental health, to your physical health, to everything like that. So floss my teeth every day. And that's like, a, so those two things are like physical non-negotiables. Um, and then I, I have to give somebody a hug every day and I have to give somebody a compliment every day. Those are oh. non-negotiables. I'm a very physical touch person. So I'm a, like, that's my love language. Yeah. If I'm not physically hugging somebody, which is why having kids is kind of useful. Um, <laughs> then I, yeah, I just use them to like give them hugs. If I don't get that, then I'm sadder. Like I need physical touch to just, you know, I'll be at events like my retreat and I'll, <laughs> legit tell people physical touch is my thing and we're not <laughs> online for me to touch you seven times so that we really are memorable to each other so I'm going to touch you seven times while we're here and I was like that will either be a hand on your shoulder a big hug or something like that and I would have people come up to me during the event and be like I've only gotten touched twice do you think we could do like a five second hug and I was like bring it in so it's now it's become a thing where people <laughs> will come over and they'll they'll just start rubbing my back and they're like just in case you hadn't been touched today I was like this is amazing oh people are gosh. touching me voluntarily so the hug and then the compliment, <laughs> which is there aren't enough people reinforcing for other people in the world that they're good enough, that they're beautiful, that they're special, that they're all those things. And it doesn't take much to change somebody's day for the better or for the worse. We drive around in cars where we're separated from the person and all we see is the actions that affect us, but not what caused those actions about maybe they're late to their kid's birthday party or they're scared about a presentation they're doing or somebody has passed away that they love. Like we have no idea yet. We feel very put out by the actions that other, other people have. And because of that, and because I feel so very close, close to that idea of assuming positive intent yeah. and recognizing that everybody has different lives. And we just, there's so many of us that we bump into each other each other a lot unexpectedly that um, every single day I need to like I, I make sure that I compliment somebody it's the person in front of me at Starbucks where I compliment their shoes or their eyes or the way they you know if I'm talking to someone on my team the way they said something or but it has to be that I need to consciously make sure that I tell at least one person something about them is lovely or a choice that they've made is good or something because then it makes me feel like there's something out in the world helping other people know they're valuable. And Brene Brown does a beautiful TEDx or TED talk mm -hmm. about the reason, I think it's about vulnerability, but the reason people are successful from her studies, that is that the true measure of success is, is is if somebody feels worthy of love, not even that they are loved, but that they feel worthy of love. And people are walking around with amazing ideas and amazing capabilities and aren't fulfilling those because they don't feel worthy of it. And if you can just give one compliment a day that makes somebody feel slightly more worthy of the compliments and the love that they receive so that they can receive it in a way that allows them to open up, then like that's, that's my task. And that to me, that's self-love. 
because I feel like I'm doing the part that I want to be doing to make things a better place, even if it's one compliment at a time. I love that. Yeah. And you're oozing with gratitude and appreciation. Um, I can just tell by the way, even that's like that being the priority for you on a daily basis just shows how, how, how much gratitude you have. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about gratitude. How does that show up for you in your life? Is that something that you actively practice? Are you intentional about how gratitude is? Um, would love to just hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I'm a horrible journaler. So I've never been good at like gratitude journals, anything yeah. like that. Like there, I know people on my team that are, so if that's you go for it and take this with like a, I'm an yeah. extrovert. So writing things down by myself, not so valuable. What I find it for me is gratitude definitely presents itself in the everyday. Yeah. But for me, I, I have found that gratitude in all like big situations in my life, that it is, it's, it's, my life is better when I flip things around to what is useful and what is good. So mm. for instance, I'll give the big example. When I left corporate and I say I quit and I did quit, but that's because I was smart and they were changing out uh, management. The husband and wife were separating and they, everybody that he had hired was getting let go. I saw that that was happening. So I went to the, like the new person they brought in and was like, Hey, I'm, I can see what's going on. And yeah. the guy that's out is hired me. So, and I worked at a deal that said, you know, basically I'll be here for three months. I'll train my team. And I have always wanted to start my own business. I'm going to do that now. And so it was great. Like it was this great thing. And, um, but I technically was losing my job. Right. Yeah. When I talk about it though, when I talk about it with people is the way I decided to view it was that I would had this massive opportunity to try something new. Uh, and I had yeah. an opportunity to make sure my team was taken care of before I left. And I had an opportunity. So I think of gratitude as opportunities. Like I have an opportunity to see things positively. Like I have an opportunity to look at the person in front of me and really see them and compliment them. Like I have an opportunity to be happy about what I just learned from this failure and use it to my advantage. And so for me, and if I think about gratitude, it's hard for me to be original. Well, I'm grateful for my kids and I'm grateful for my health and I'm grateful. But if I see this opportunity, like, wow, if I can be, have a healthy body, I can show my kids these things. So for me, gratitude I, I use it and leverage it as a way of looking at it as opportunities, opportunities to be positive versus negative. I'm going to give you like a, a virtual hug just because you're <laughs> like a hug person. Um, Cause that was like my favorite thing I think I've heard all day. I, I love the lens that you're looking through as you're, as you're evaluating uh, just even your life choices. It's so amazing to me. Um, yeah. Can I, can I add one thing too? Because please, please. I get made fun of all the time for this, but I, I do this all the, I was just at the, uh, a conference I was speaking at in, in Wisconsin and we were sitting there and there was, um, you know, a girl next to me who's a good friend of mine. And she's like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, I've got this video I'm putting on YouTube and it's pain in the butt and this thing's happening and this thing's happening. And I, and I was like, I know, God, you poor thing. You're here speaking at a conference. It's on videography. You have, you know, 10,000 plus people that watch you on YouTube. You make great money off of these courses. And I was just naming all of these amazing <laughs> things that have happened or that people would die for. And I was like, God, that one video, I totally, I get it. It's like, poor <laughs> you. And I do that a lot. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You live in San Diego and you get to work by the beach. And yeah, I know your kid is <laughs> like the, yeah. Yeah, but what it does is, it, I mean, it's important because what we do is. is we focus on the one thing that sucks and we yes. forget that there's so much else. And so gratitude for me kind of has to be snarky for yeah. it to work on me. Like the real woo-woo gratitude where we all hug and kumbaya does not sit in my brain. But the snarky like, hey, hey, lady, think about all those things that you've got. Like, seriously, <laughs> like somebody, the earrings I'm wearing right now were from a... Um, a fair trade company. Cause I like to have very purposeful jewelry. Yeah. And when you think about it, I like it because wearing these, somebody got paid like 35 cents an hour, right. To make these earrings and that feeds their family. You know what I mean? Like they go home so incredibly grateful that somebody's buying the thing that they're making. How on earth can I complain that my coffee, they didn't put enough cream in it. Like they just don't have that 
space and I like to surround myself with physical reminders of just all the things I have because it's, I mean, we're very, we're very spoiled. We're very that, spoiled. That is a brilliant hack, actually. Surrounding yourself with, with physical reminders, whether it be fair trade clothing or bags or just simple reminders or brands that allow you to look back at yourself and, and, and appreciate everything you have. And I want to kind of segue that into just the concept of support. Um, you know, when we, you, you, you said that there's a lot of physical things we can have in our life. What about uh, I know that you run an online community for people who um, are, are mm-hmm. navigating all of this for balance and support. So, you know, from, from your mm-hmm. perspective, you know, what kind of a community can help somebody kind of get to this point where, um, where they're, they're in an active state of appreciation? Just talk to me about your world and, 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 and how that all falls together for you. Yeah. Well, I think you've got to recognize it. Like, like I was saying before, there's no one community that's going to solve all the things. So, you, so I'm, I'm in the midst of writing my third book. Um, which I'm massively excited about. I just did yeah. my first talk about it. It'll come out in October, but I'm starting to do talks on that. We just finished the cover design that my community helped me you know, figure out. But it's called Climb Your Own Ladder, uh, Becoming the CEO of Your Own Business. And it, it's really about giving ourselves permission to not be the CEO first, right? Um, but one thing I talk about, there's pillars to climbing your own ladder. And one of the pillars is that somebody has to be holding your ladder. And when we talk about support, we use it as a very jargony word. Like you need someone, you need a support system, you need a support community. What support is, is stability. When you think about it in like the ladder analogy, someone holding the the bottom of the ladder, it all goes back to the decision and decision confidence. They hold the bottom of the ladder so you can confidently climb without worrying about falling over. Mm, So if we think about support systems, not as the word support, but we think about it as what do we need to feel stable? Then you can start looking at, okay, what do I need to help me feel stable about the situation I'm in or the decisions I'm making? So if you just had a baby, you're going to want to join communities of other women who have just had a baby and maybe a community of women who have had babies 10 years ago and are giving great advice, right? Like if you just bought a house and moved to a new city, maybe you want to go to a meetup of people who are new to the city so that you guys can explore the city together. So what you want to think about is in the situation that you're in, what kind of support do you need that will help create stability for you? Mm. Um, And that can be stability in routine, if that's what you need, that can be stability in venting and saying, here's what I'm getting challenged with so that other people can tell you, oh my goodness, I have those same challenges. So you don't feel alone and isolated, right, right, yeah. right? It may be stability in advice where you buy into a paid program and they give you advice that you just listen to and you execute because the stability you need is in someone being your guide. Yeah. And so what you got to decide is what kind of stability do you need? And that's the kind of support you seek. I think the, the boss mom community has grown so well because for me, stability is in decision confidence. And in order to do that, we have to brainstorm together and get other people to help us with ideas. Yeah. And so the boss mom community is really a think tank. It's a think tank for parenting and for business. And that's what it is. And we give women permission to ask the questions that a lot of groups don't let you ask because they consider it promo. But my stance is if you actually want help making decisions in your business and it actually benefits your business, good for you. Yeah. Like I want to help you decide on the name of your opt-in and the cover of your book. And every single time that I think I have the answer, I'm not right when I go out and ask my community, right? Like I'm too yeah. close to things and you don't realize that. So, so my answer to you is, is you're going to have more than one support system because nobody can hold the bottom of your ladder forever. Like people need a rest from supporting you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's yeah. all really heavy. It's gotta, be, it's gotta be more than one person. And think of it not as support, but as stability. And what do you need in your life to help you create stability and find the groups and the places, whether it's physical or online and or paid or unpaid to help give you that stability. And then once you feel like you've gotten past that, don't be afraid to move away from something and into something new. Like when something stops serving you, opportunity cost is a big word again. Like don't stay in a place forever just because you've been there. Yeah. Stay in a place as long as it serves you and then move into another place. And everybody will understand that you have moved into a different phase of your life. And if they don't, then it wasn't the right place to be in the first place. I love that. So tell me more about your new community. I know you had mentioned um, a new community that can help people sort of transition into 
uh, a role of support if they don't have one. Um, tell me more about that. Okay. Well, so we have Boss Mom is our is our main hub. It's like our think tank, and it's it's truly a community that is. Um, God, it's truly a community that it like helps women legit grow their businesses. It's almost like an ecosystem where everybody's hiring each other within the group. It's amazing. Awesome. Um, and then, yeah. And then we have, we have what's called raising your business, which actually helps people grow their business. And that's a, a program that I, that I walk people through. Um, and then once my third book comes out, that will come out. But one thing that we do have is we have a, a resource for everybody that teaches you how to actually engage online. Mm. So it teaches you how to engage in, in mainly in Facebook, but it applies to LinkedIn and other places that have forums. But the idea is how do you actually engage without feeling overwhelmed mm. by being in a space? Because we do, what happens is we get in and then we want to answer everybody's questions and we want to support everybody all the time. Um, and that's actually unhealthy right? Like you can, you can self care too much. You can support too much. You can work too much. You can parent too much. You can sleep too much. Like there's, you know, more is definitely more sometimes. Um, and so we teach you how to actually engage online to help get the support you need and help give support in a really balanced way that serves you in your life and your business at the same time. And that's been a really powerful resource so that people don't look at social media and and not get the support they need because it seems overwhelming. How can I get access to that resource? That sounds amazing. I actually yeah. want to get it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So it's just boss mom.com forward slash BMC, which is, we call it the boss mom companion. Sweet. Um, yeah. So boss mom.com forward slash BMC. And it's super cool. You get to see my face. There's a lot of me talking. Yeah. Walking you through everything. <laughs> Well, if it's as wonderful as this conversation's been, I'm sure everybody's going to be jumping for joy. Um, well, I'm this animated. You guys yeah. probably can't see me, but I'm, I use my hands a lot. I uh, make a lot yeah. of funny. Actually, when I do photography at my events, it's, I always take the outtakes because um, they'll take pictures and they try to get me in like really power poses on stage, but I'm just a jokester. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I'm constantly moving, going up and down. Like, yeah. So all of my pictures of me on stage, I look like a complete idiot. Uh, and I post them with pride. A happy um, idiot. Cause it's happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Killing it. Um, but, uh, no, I wanted to ask, uh, actually one last question. Um, yeah. because, uh, I ask everybody this question, but in the midst of everything that's ever happened in your life, from you going through the challenges you did to now being where you are in a place of success, how do you stay grounded every day? One of the things I do is I, like, I look into the community that I, like my boss mom community, I'm um, in my paid programs and my clients. And the reason we do what we do is to help people most often, if you're in coaching, like I am, help people get past the challenges you had quicker. Like you want to use your knowledge, right? Yeah. So for me, staying grounded a lot is one, looking at people behind me and where they're going and the trials and tribulations and how far they've come. And then I also have to look at the people in front of me and see how far I still have to go because grounding is all about like recognizing where you are yeah. and for the people that think just let it go off in their head that they're everything that they're amazing that they're center like i think being conscious and uh and this is why kids like they talk about kids not reaching consciousness until a certain uh, age consciousness is truly the recognition of the world outside self Right. And so being selfish is to think that you are the center of the universe of all things and that all things revolve and react around you. So to me, to stay grounded is to recognize the world around me, to see the people behind me, to see people before me, before I ever gauge where I'm at, so that I can always feel very grounded in my surroundings to know I've been there and I'm helping the people that aren't there yet, but I'm not here yet and I still have a place to go. And so I'm always in I'm always in this in this timeline as opposed to being at the end, which I think thinking you're at the end is, is the thing that gets that inflated ego that people can get. It's like, I know, I know all the things I've got all the experience. I don't need anything else, uh, which we all know is obviously not true. So. Tana, you might be my favorite person ever. <laughs> and, um, I am grateful beyond grateful 
to have uh, spent uh, this conversation with you. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody listening uh, enjoyed this conversation. Um, we will send all the links and all the goodies that Dana Banana is sharing with us. And um, and I just wanted to say thank you, Dana. I yeah, I, I, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, it's been an absolute best glass, and everybody go drink coffee. Yes, there it is. There it is. There's the plug, the shameless plug. Uh, but uh, everybody, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Stay Grounded podcast. Again, my name is Raj, and until next time, stay grounded. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of the Stay Grounded podcast brought to you by Java Press Coffee Company. My name is Raj. And I hope you found this interview helpful as you create your own ways to make daily happiness a priority. If you're interested in learning more about how your morning coffee can turn into a consistent source of joy in your life, visit www.javapress.com to learn how our products can help you do that and use the coupon code podcast for 10% off your purchase. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Stay grounded.